Hey, I'm Chris F from Make Everything, and today we're going to try to turn this railroad spike into a pair of scissors. Check it out. All right, so starting off this project, I'm going to be using the induction heater for this whole thing. Now, this is the, really the first blacksmithing project that I'm doing with the heater, and I'm excited to see how it does. Um, I'm using a high carbon railroad spike, and I bought a bunch of these over on eBay just to sort of experiment with. Now, I've got an idea in my head on how I'm going to form out the scissors, but I really don't have any experience forging anything like this, so it's a lot of guesswork. The induction heater does a great job getting it nice and hot, and I'm trying to be careful with my hammer blows to make sure that I draw this thing out in kind of the right way. Now, I'm trying to get both of the sides of the scissor out of this one railroad spike. So I flatten out the head of the spike, and then I go ahead and flatten out the tip. My thought here is that I'm going to make the larger scissor hole out of the head of the spike and the smaller scissor finger hole out of the tip. Now I do a little center punch and then use this drift to open up that hole and I'm trying to get as much done as I can before it cools down, but also being careful not to get the drift stuck in that hole. I'm using a Pritchard hole on this anvil to keep the hole nice and square and not have it blow out the backside. Now with the induction heater, this material is actually getting a little bit small for that size coil. I only have one coil, but the most efficient way to use an induction forge is to have the coil be very close to the edges of the material. Now that being said, I am able to get everything nice and hot, and by taking a couple of additional heats, I can go through and ream out this hole with that drift. It's important that I make sure the material is nice and hot because I don't want to rip the edge of the material because I really want to get this all done out of one single railroad spike. Now, for most of this project, I'm using my pretty large 400-pound anvil that you see in the background, but I have a smaller 120-pound anvil with a much smaller horn on it, and that's perfect for opening up the holes for the scissors. Now, I can just very gently kind of tap that, and I'm not going super, super hard. I want to keep the thickness consistent as I go, and so I'm using kind of medium hammer strikes and trying to keep it, you know, a reasonable shape and thickness um, in both directions so that I don't wind up tearing it out. My big concern here is that when I'm trying to stretch out this hole, I'm going to wind up making the material too thin in one area, and then that's going to lead to the whole thing breaking, and I'd have to basically start over. Now, the larger finger hole wound up with a kind of interesting shape. It's not really perfectly round, but I like that it gives it a little bit of character. And as I'm going, I kind of leave that little kind of swoop in the end of it. Now, I had drawn up what I wanted by tracing another pair of scissors, and I had an idea of how long I wanted it to be. Now, as I'm looking at it, I'm realizing that this piece of material just isn't going to be long enough to get both halves out of it. So I make a mark sort of in the center, and then I start heating up the center of the bar and drawing it out over the horn of the anvil. Now, blacksmithing is not something that I have a ton of experience with, but I've watched a lot of videos and um, watched a lot of my friends do work, and I feel like it's helped me understand the ways to manipulate the metal and get things to stretch out. So right now, the piece is like maybe 8 inches between the two loops, and I need it to be closer to 10 or 11. So you could actually watch, if you look closely, that the material is growing and stretching as I'm hammering it over the ed edge of the anvil, hammering it on the sides, and then flattening it out. Now, by stretching the material in this way, I'm also making it thinner, which is going to make it easier for me to make the actual scissor blades. So now I'm up to about 10 inches between the loops, and I make a diagonal mark that I'll then heat up, and I will cut this off using a hot cut over on the anvil. Now, with both of these pieces cut, I can see that they're both pretty close to the length that I need, but they're also a lot larger than they need to be. Now, not knowing how far I'm going to be able to push these, I start by shouldering in near the hole and basically stretching out the blade of the scissor half. I'm trying to be really careful here because I don't want to damage the loop that I, you know, kind of crafted out. And I'm very happy with the way the loops are at this point, so I don't want to mess those up. One of the nice things about the induction forge is you can really isolate the heat. So you can see how I'm able to heat right in front of the loop and not actually get the loop hot, which would then potentially cause it to get deformed. If I was doing this in a propane forge, I'd have a lot harder time isolating the heat in that way. The whole piece would wind up getting pretty hot. So I guess I could be using a torch, but again, that wouldn't be super efficient. 
Now I've got these little bending forks in my vise and I have my wooden form uh, and my plan over next to it so I can get it close. And here I'm just forging out the blade. Now I'm trying to be really deliberate with my hammer strikes here. I'm not hitting super hard and I'm just drawing out that piece of material and trying to get it nice and square. I'm using what's called a Hoffy hammer. Um, it is designed by Ori Hoffy. I was turned on to these by my friend Jeff Fader and it's got a pretty flat face on it. So it's nice for keeping nice flat edges on your material. I move over to the larger side of the scissor and I put in two shoulders on this side for this sort of bend that I had seen when I was looking at the model pair that I'm kind of basing these off of. Now I went a little far on that second shoulder. It's a little too deep. It's really the only thing I don't like about how these came out in the end, but overall, they're still pretty good in my eyes. Again, carefully drawing out that blade section and getting it nice and hot so that I can draw it out, make it a little bit longer and flatter so that it's a little bit easier to grind in once I get it to the final length. A little more bending over on that jig to try to get the shape just perfect. And then I wind up with two halves of the scissor that are pretty close in their rough forging. The last thing I did was I opened up the loop on the larger pair, larger side of the scissors. I had squashed it down so that it would fit through the coil on the forge. And now that all the forging was done, I could kind of bring it to its final shape and make it look nice. You can sort of see where I'm heading now. Now I wanted to make both sides of both of these pieces pretty flat. So I have this little kind of wooden jig that I use. It's got a V in the bottom, so it keeps the piece from sliding. And I'm just using a 60 grit grinding belt to get those pieces kind of roughed in flat. You know, this took a pretty good amount of time and I was trying to be careful not to overheat the material, but in the end, I think it was worth doing. Now I could have gone over to my surface grinder to get these things perfectly flat, but I wanted it to be a little more of kind of a handmade process here. I didn't want to use the milling machine or the surface grinder. I really wanted to do this with, you know, the minimal amount of tools. Now that the pieces are pretty much flat, I can sort of visualize where the blades are going to be. Now on the scissors that I'm modeling these off, um, the single hole blade is more pointy while the other side is a little more broad. Now I don't really know anything about the way scissors are supposed to be made, so I'm just guessing. Um, one of the things that I did notice though is that both of the sides of the scissor have a shoulder in them and that shoulder is what stops the blades from going too far. So right now I'm grinding in that shoulder using the belt grinder and you can sort of see on the left side how I'm grinding in a shoulder there and that's just going to allow these things to stop when they're closed. Now I use these little clamps to hold them together and then I use a drill bit to drill an eighth inch hole through both pieces which is going to allow me to put a pin in there just so that I can start mocking things up. I wound up putting a folding knife pivot in there so that I could bolt these together and continue to work on them before I drilled it out to its final, final hole size. Now I drew out where I wanted the blades to end and then I could go over to the bandsaw and rough cut them so that I had the close enough shape and I could start grinding them in. Now, my last video was about the metal dust collector and I'm using it on this project. It worked out really great, the Magnumatic. I'm super happy that I have it because it allowed me to do this work without having to put a ton of metal dust in the air in my shop. I'm using my grinder to even further shape these and then I put the two halves together and I can sort of grind them simultaneously. It's an interesting process. I'm used to making knives, uh, folding knives, you know, fixed blade knives, chef's knives but it's interesting to make a basically two knives that have to bolt together and both function. So it was kind of fun to take on that challenge and try to get things all symmetrical and also have them both work, even though, you know, there's not really a set design here. I have a grinding guard that I use on knives that I decided to use for the shoulder on the smaller side of the scissor. By getting this guard on there, I'm able to make sure that I don't grind too far and try to get that kind of flat section. Now I can drill for the threaded hole and the clearance hole that I'm going to be using on this. I'm going to be using a number 10 32 screw. So I drill the proper size tap hole and then I use that swivel jaw vise to hold the scissor half and I tap it with this regular old tap.
At this point, the metal is soft. I haven't hardened it. And I was very careful that while I was doing this process, I didn't ever actually quench these halves. Um, I let them air cool and normalize every time I would heat them, which allowed them to stay nice and soft so I could work on them. Once that hole was tapped, I could go over to the heat treating. Now, this is the first time I've ever heat treated anything with the induction forge, and I'm using vegetable oil to harden this blade. You can see there are a couple pieces of metal in that uh, paint can, and those I use to heat up the oil prior to doing that quench. Now, what I like to do is after I quench on the hardening cycle is I like to hit them on a wire wheel so I can see the color, and then I actually tempered them back in the induction forge as well. It's a little hard to tell in the video, but I let them get to like a straw color, and then I let them air cool. I wasn't sure how this high carbon railroad spike would heat treat, so I went over to my hardness tester, and I wound up getting about 51 to 53 Rockwell. It's a little soft for a knife, but I think considering these high carbon spikes don't usually get super hard, I was pretty happy with it. So now I'm just taking a file and I'm trying to flatten the shearing side of both of the blades. Now it's very important that these blades be super flat because when I tighten the screw, if there are any variations in them, they might not cut correctly. So I'm very careful to have my file very, very flat and I'm just pushing and trying to get these things to work as well as I possibly can before I put an edge on them. A good trick is to take a Sharpie and then use your file and it acts as sort of like a guide, a guide paint, like a guide coat, so that you know where your file is cutting and where it isn't. And now I just had to adjust the shoulder a little bit. For this, I used a little carbide burr on a Dremel and I just sort of contoured it to match the other scissor half so that I would get the scissors to close at the perfect location. Now this is all going to kind of change as I grind them because I'm going to be removing material from different places, but at least it's getting me close. Now at this point, I go over to the downdraft table and I use my little die grinder and a little tiny flap disc from Faird to start shaping the handles. Now I could have done this on the belt grinder, but there's something a little more natural about grinding around something like this. It helps you get the pieces to be a little more round, and I really like the process of sort of sculpting the handles of these scissors by hand. I'm able to hold them and manipulate them, and with a belt grinder, a lot of times you'll wind up with some shoulders and cuts, and I wanted these things to be really organic looking. The next thing I did was I got this sort of drum flap from Faird, and I got it wedged inside the holes, and what's nice about it is it's got a pretty strong abrasive on it, and once you get it to contour, you can really push hard, and you can get a lot of those forging marks out. Now I did leave some forging marks inside the larger hole because I wanted people to realize if they held these in their hand that they you know, weren't just cut out of a piece of plate and they were forged. So I wanted to leave a little bit of character there, but I was able to make them super soft so that they don't hurt your fingers when you use them. Now that that rough shaping was done, I could start to grind in the bevels on the scissor halves. Now I was gonna make a jig for this, but I figured I would try my hand at freehand grinding them. And it took a little bit of practice to get the bevel correctly, but once I did, it came out really nice. This dramatically reduced the weight of each side of the scissor half, and after messing with them for a while and feeling them once they were ground, I really noticed how much more nimble and delicate they felt. It was a really cool feeling to kind of get these grinds in, and I used that grind guard just so that I wouldn't go beyond my plunge line, and it worked out really, really well. The other thing I had to be very cautious of here was ruining my temper, so I was very careful to quench as soon as the pieces got hot. And you notice I'm wearing rubber gloves so that I can feel the heat as I'm grinding in those bevels and make sure that they don't get so hot that I ruin the temper. At this point, I can do a little bit of finishing and fixing and I can double check you know, the fit as I'm going. I take off the grinding belt and I put on this 220 grit belt and I take off my platen so that I can use it as a slack belt and really contour in those edges. This is what's gonna give it that more natural feel and really soften up anything that might have been left over from when I was using the flap wheel. Again, I want these things to be nice and soft and organic on the handle so they're comfortable to use. The next thing I did was I went over to a granite surface plate and just using a piece of 400 grit sandpaper sort of ground in those flats on the shear side so that I would have a nice you know, fit up when I put the things together, they wouldn't bind up or grind. You know, I wanted to make that pretty polished so that it would work out well. And then finally, I could grind in a sharpening bevel. Now for this, I use a one by 30, and this is a 600 grit belt. I'm grinding in basically a micro bevel, and then I'm going to switch over to a leather belt, 
and the leather belt is going to give me my sort of final sharpness. Now I want both halves of these scissors to be super sharp so that there's no question that they'll be able to cut whatever I put them through. Also too, a sharper, the sharper the pair of scissors, the more delicate material you can cut and also the straighter that they're going to cut. Now once that was done, there was a little bit of material on the front and I could do just a tiny bit of shaping on the front end of the scissor. Now at this point, I still have a, you know, like a Phillips head screw in there and there's still just a little bit of final shaping to be done, but these things are already sharp, so I have to be very careful with everything that I'm doing. Now for the bolt that I'm gonna use, I have this nice little 1032 Allen key bolt and I custom shape the dome and custom cut it down so it'll fit nice. Now the last step is I'm using these soft Scotch-Brite style wheels on a open end motor. And this is a really great way to get sort of a unitized finished and they're very soft so I can get into all those little nooks and crannies and I'm doing this all over the downdraft table. And once that's done, the last thing to do is to add my touch mark, which is a little Z. I had left the handle soft so this thing popped in pretty nice and then I can clean up each of the halves and get this thing assembled. Overall, I'm just so happy with how these came out. Um, this is really the first complicated forging project that I've ever done by myself. I have a lot of friends that are really talented blacksmiths and they've helped me so much along the way and to learn what to do, but to take on something like this on my own and to take a raw piece of material like a railroad spike, you know, a fixed size, not something that I could go out and order the perfect size of, it was a real big challenge for me. They work really well, they cut great, they look good and they feel good, and I'm just super thrilled with how they came out. All right, that about does it for this video. I'm super happy with how these things came out. Um, making a pair of scissors has been something that I've really wanted to do for a long time. Paul Pinto and I attempted to make a pair a couple of years ago. We didn't really have the right stuff and weren't really prepared for it, and it went horribly. So walking into this project, I didn't really think it was gonna go as well as it did. Uh, that being said, it was super fun. Using the induction forge just made it that much easier for me to kind of do a project like this, because instead of having to put this thing in and out of a gas forge or a coal forge all day. I was able to just heat it as I needed. Um, and what was also really cool about the induction forge was this is a relatively small part and I have a bad habit of kind of leaving things in a propane forge too long and then letting them get too hot and it actually makes forging them a little bit harder. They're a little too soft. So with the induction forge, I was able to really watch the temperature and make sure that I didn't uh, overheat them and, you know, kind of isolate areas. Um, anyway, Really fun project. I hope you guys enjoyed watching it. I had a lot of fun making it. If you have any, if you have any questions, please leave them down below in the comments. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you enjoyed it and if you want to see more videos like this. I've got a lot of great projects coming up and I've got the power hammer almost ready to go. So I've got some fun blacksmithing projects in mind for that as well. Um, if you want to see what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis, follow me right here at Make Everything Shop on Instagram. I post all the time and I'm usually answering questions and kind of showing behind the scenes what I'm up to. I showed a bunch of clips um, and sort of some of the issues that I had while I was making these over on there. So you could check me out there if you'd like. Again, I'm Chris Zeff from Make Everything. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope to see you on the next one.